It's the most famous bull in the automotive world. A brand born from anger. Ferruccio Lamborghini was pissed off. And synonymous with high performance exclusivity. They've been known as the company that makes wedgie cars that go really fast in a straight line, and that's it. For over 50 years, Lamborghini has handcrafted high-end Italian supercars. The whole point of a Lamborghini is to look and to sound outrageous. Their most popular model is the best-selling Italian supercar in history. The Gallardo was the most successful Italian supercar of all time. The Gallardo absolutely was the car that put this company on firm ground. Now, the Gallardo needs to be replaced. So for the model, it comes once a decade for us. So it's a very critical time, a very demanding time. One misstep could spell disaster for the mark. We have only one bullet in our gun. And if we miss, then for a decade, we are wiped out. It's an Italian bullet called the Lamborghini Huracan. inspired silhouette blasts from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in just two and a half seconds. It has a top speed of 325 kilometers per hour. One quarter the speed of sound and the weight of an entire automotive brand hinging on its success. The Lamborghini Huracan is the newest machine from the house of the raging bull one of the most famed and feared marks in the automotive world. Yet the brand owes its creation to two men and a myth. In post-war Italy, industrialist Ferruccio Lamborghini is making a fortune building tractors. It's a booming business in the agrarian region of Emilia-Romagna, a place where farming has ruled for centuries. By 1960, his company sells over 400 tractors per month. The wealthy industrialist buys a Ferrari 250 GT. But as the legend goes, the car has a problem with its clutch. Perugia Lamborghini bought a Ferrari, it broke. He went back over to Enzo, screamed at him, and said, you know, mm, I can build a better car. This was started in anger. Nothing looks like a Lamborghini. Nothing performs like a Lamborghini. They're a very unique brand. Ferruccio Lamborghini immediately sets his gaze on Enzo's empire. In 1963, he purchases a large plot of land 25 kilometers from Bologna, Italy, in the town of Sant'Agata Bolognese, with only one goal, manufacturing cutting-edge Italian supercars. Sant'Agata is a little town that you definitely never would have heard of if it weren't for the fact that there are Lamborghinis driving all up and down these roads like maniacs. Three years later, in 1966, Ferruccio puts both Enzo and the world on notice. He introduces the Miura. The mid-engine two-seat V12-powered sports car is widely considered to be the world's first true supercar. They were very hand-built. These were kind of craftsman pieces. You were lucky if it started, and if, if it didn't explode into flames, bonus. In 1974, the brand takes the next step and reinvents the very supercar genre it helps create. Introducing an edgy, angular machine called the Countach. It lays the groundwork for all modern Lamborghinis. The Countach was described as a, the holy desire to build a car with a single line, and the single line was the silhouette of this car. And we are still playing around this initial concept. While the brilliant looks and Italian V12 engine captivate auto fans, the machines are unreliable and poorly made. For the next 35 years, the brand lists from brilliancy to bankruptcy, while at the same time crystallizing a supercar mythology. Lamborghini, you know, has gone through a number of owners over the years. They've had big ups and downs in their financial situation. It's been really rocky. In 1998, Audi purchases the brand and dramatically changes its fortunes. The German automaker's first task is to re-inject life into the company. Lamborghini probably was closer to ceasing to exist than we'd like to think. In 2003, the masterstroke, the Gallardo. A smaller, lighter, less expensive V10-powered supercar. The Gallardo was, let me say, it's an entry-level supercar. The machine's lower price tag opens up new markets to the brand. 
the number of people on the planet who can afford these cars is pretty small. And you do need to be careful that not everyone who lives in those neighborhoods has one. One year after putting the Gallardo into production, Audi taps Stefan Winkelmann to be the company's new CEO. It was one year after the, the Gallardo was introduced. The company was smaller, we had less people. Finkelman's first order of business is to transform the automaker into a modern brand. Once the Gallardo happened, Lamborghini started making real cars. Under his watch, the company has gone from pretty dire straight to today, where they're stronger than they've ever been and selling more cars than they've ever sold. In 2002, the year before the Gallardo, the brand sells just 424 cars. After the Gallardo, they sell 1,305. It was a starting point. We all realized it at that stage. By 2007, the mark experiences a 467% sales increase, selling a record 2,406 machines. This is without question the most commercially successful era of Lamborghini. They've never been as financially stable. Financial stability keeps the brand on solid footing, but doesn't make them ordinary. In the real world, seeing a Lambo is a very rare event. In the entire world, there's less than 50,000 Lamborghinis. If there are 71 million cars produced in the year 2013, we had a bit more than 2,000. In its 50-year history, the House of the Raging Bull has built close to 30,000 cars. Not only was the Gallardo the most successful Lamborghini ever made, but in its 10-year run, it accounted for more than half of all Lamborghinis ever made. We kept it fresh and updated almost a decade. A decade is a very long time in the realm of the supercar, and cutting-edge tech ages. All the company was under pressure and there was several meetings because when you start in a new project, you try to understand what is needed. For Lamborghini, the stakes are clear and dramatic. The Gallardo keeps the brand in business. I imagine everyone at Lamborghini was very cautious. If its replacement fails, it spells disaster. With the task to be able to replace uh, the Gallardo, but to increase the success of the car and uh, say trouble from the beginning in order to think what can be better. Repeating the Gallardo's success is a tricky proposition. In 2010, at the tail end of a worldwide depression that sees Lamborghini's sales drop 45%, the brand decides it's time to replace an icon. It's creating something which is state of the art and pressure maybe, but a lot of expectation. My briefing to the team in general four or five years ago was very easy. But turning it into reality is hard because it must equal the Gallardo's success. We developed a car which has to have an outlook of almost another decade. So you have to think forward. And this is one of the most difficult things. To devise a revolutionary machine, the Lamborghini team focuses on three levels of performance. There are three points which are key. One is acceleration, the other one is top speed, and then handling. In the past, number one was always top speed. For decades, top speed was a selective club. Only a few machines could crack 320 kilometers per hour. Lamborghini was one of the few. Accelerating and having the easiness in the corners. And this is done with the power to weight ratio. Finding that balance is tricky when you're a niche manufacturer. The challenge for a small manufacturer is the amount of money and the brains you put in place. The brand not only banks on its heritage, but also its unique Italian design aesthetic. The people which are living here, they have a certain attitude. And Italians, they are known for style. I think that Italy, it's one of the few one which is creating those type of cars. The process of designing the Gallardo replacement starts with a basic set of rules. We try to give simple rules uh, to the designers, which the first one is that the design has always to be very different, but you know that it can't be anything else than a Lamborghini. The second thing is a form always follows function. So there is no things which are pimped up or made beautiful just to show something which is not functional. The third one, and our inspiration is always coming from the aeronautic industry. 
This car was inspired by the stealth fighter. They loved the angles and the purpose and the look of a F-22 and the B-1 and all these, these really neat airplanes. Filippo Perini is the man entrusted with bringing those stealth fighters for the road to life inside of the Lamborghini Centro Stile design studio. This room is the place where the new Lamborghini, the idea and the concept grow up here. Perini is one of the most outrageous automotive designers in the world. When we stop to work, we start to speak about cars, and this is uh, completely crazy. I think that uh, Lamborghini is uh, built by, by a man for challenge. You know? It's something that we have to respect, and in the daily job, this is very tough. For Perini, that willingness to get better starts at an early age. He pens his first car at the age of two. This is my mother. I never take care about, about stuff like this, but my mother, yes. No, she was uh, really attracted by my inclination to do sketches and to send sketches to the magazines. This is a magazine that was used to show artwork made by children, and I was one of them. And this is a Lamborghini. <laughs> In 2011, Parini improves on the past when he pens the Aventador, Lamborghini's newest flagship supercar. You can see a lot now in aeronautics that there are uh, many planes that are not so soft. First of all, because they have to be stealth. The styling echoes the lines of the legendary Countach, Diablo, and Murcielago, but also radically pushes the brand into a new direction. Every bit of Italian design that's successful has a little bit of kitsch in it, too. It's a little bit too far. If you look at modern Lamborghinis, you see it's probably one step too far. But isn't that the whole point of these cars? The design we are building is driven by the silhouette. It's, uh, this, this line is uh, in the middle. In the Huracan, is a single one. It's monobody. My guys, my designers, the engineers, they want to do better. They want to at least you know, be a bit above what the others have done. The process starts with an internal design competition. When we do a competition for a new product, we have at least two main goals. One is to do a beautiful car, and the second is to be the people that are winning the, the, the contest. It's always very important to be present in, the, in, in this game and to be winner. That contest could very well determine the survival of the brand. It was very important for them to really get this car right. When you're pushing the boundaries of contemporary design, getting the car right means standing up for your vision. Probably the beauty of the design job is, let me say, 10% of the game. The rest, 90%, is to save what you've done in the beginning of the project. Designing for the future keeps the brand relevant. At the end, you cannot follow the trend of the market. Otherwise, you cannot be a winner. That future unfolds in a very 21st century way, completely digital. In a land of hallowed artisans, Lamborghini no longer uses clay to design their cars. It's a very traditional business to design a car. You sketch it, maybe these days you do some computer renderings, but you build a clay model and you shape it by hand and you really make this so you can stand back and look at it. Lamborghini doesn't do this anymore. They design the entire car on a computer. It's very, very normal for me now to judge a new design in a monitor of 21 inches. It doesn't matter. And after we print the model, it doesn't matter the scale. It's an incredible process, and it gives them a lot of freedom to make little changes, and they can do it immediately. This is the process, because it's much more lean, it's much more driven by desire. Behind the uh, monitor, there, are, there is always a designer. If you don't switch on, a computer is doing nothing. Uh, this process is driven by the brain of a man. The machine is not only made by man, but lusted after, too. The sex appeal comes from different, no, we cannot say, it. it's porn. <laughs> it's not only sex, it's beautiful. That beauty starts inside one of the most revered supercar factories in the world. Antagata is the hometown of Lamborghini, and for us it's special because the brand needs roots. Arriving at the Lamborghini factory for the first time is, is really a neat experience. You're driving and you're passing all these farms and there's nothing, and then you come into this little town and then here's the Lamborghini factory. And if you get back into the factory itself, it's still the factory that it was 60 years ago. It's still the same building. They've added more buildings, but it's still there. The factory is located in the heart of Italy's Emilia-Romagna region, otherwise known to automotive fans as La Terra di Motori. 
Emilia Romagna, it's called also La Terra dei Motori. So it's something that a lot of super sports car brands are here. In this area, there is a kind of a Bermuda Triangle of performances. If you think about Ducati, Ferrari, Pagani, there is a concentration of needing horsepower. I don't know why there are uh, so many companies, so many car designers, uh, so many car fans. I have some friends here that they cannot speak about normal... Uh, they are only speaking about car. That speed comes together on hallowed supercar ground. Today's Lamborghinis are assembled in the very same building that Ferruccio used in the 1960s. It's been heavily modernized. It's clean and well lit and spacious. It's not, you know, a little dusty old shop anymore. It's a fully modern factory. That factory 20 years ago didn't look as organized as it does now. It was wires everywhere, people tripping over stuff, fighting, throwing cigarettes and espresso at each other. I mean, you can imagine it was just nuts. The man responsible for Lamborghini's modern factory is Ranieri Nicoli. He's the director of production at Lamborghini. I'm in charge of all the things you are seeing here, so all the assemble of the car, and also of the logistic of the parts, and all the assemble the car in Lamborghini. It's Ranieri's job to get the factory ready for Huracan assembly. It's really a challenge. When a new car is born, it's, uh, it's really something complicated, because you have to imagine that a car is made by something like 2,000 parts. All this activity in, uh, all together is really complicated. Coordinating all those parts takes place on 22 stations that produce just 13 cars per day. We are at the starting point of our assembly line, composed by 22 stations. In each station, we are starting to assemble some parts in order to start from naked cars. All 22 stations are run by artisanal mechanics. Craftsmanship is the big word in our factory. We have two assembly lines, and these lines are going slower than a highly automated factory. It's a craftsman's approach to car building, based on perfection. We have more people doing the assembly, and this is craftsmanship, but also the love of the people. Typically, the line moves every 34 minutes. This is a combination between craftsmanship, but also technology. The car has to be unique for each customer. That quality has a truly national identity. Lamborghini for Italy means cars, means passion, means speed, and this is something that for Italian guys, the best place. Building an Huracan starts with the machine's body entering the line. So basically here we are starting to assemble the new Lamborghini Huracan. This is the first station. Bodies are painted off-site in one of 19 colors and arrive ready to hit the ground running. Only at Lamborghini, the onus isn't on speed, but speciality. It's not an assembly line running through as quickly as they can either. There's only a small number of workstations. It will take months to ramp up production on the new Huracan, a small price to pay when you're betting your brand on a platform that needs to survive for a decade. We are in the starting phase of production of the, of the Huracan. So the, our production is quite low because we are starting to produce the first car. After the, you develop a car, then you have all the parts which are coming together until it finally fits with the puzzle and with the quality we want. And then we ramp up. High-speed manufacturing at Lamborghini still isn't all that fast. An Italian factory is kind of unique because the Italian cars that you think of are your supercars, are your Ferraris and Lamborghinis. When you get to cars like that, they're being built low volume. It's a slower process. It will take two days to build an Huracan once the factory hits full production. You know, an Italian car factory, these people are passionate. They want to be there. They are true believers in the brand. They really are passionate about the product. Like the design team foregoing clay, Lamborghini tests the process of putting the Huracan together with a pre-production series of machines. So we are doing this job first with the electronic file. We try to figure out how we can assemble the parts. And in the same time, we try to design the line in order to say, OK, in this station, we will assemble this part. In the other station, we will assemble the other part, because we can't assemble all the parts uh, in, uh, without the right sequence. Finding the correct installation sequence is just one dimension. Ergonomics and tooling concerns are important, too. 
correct means ergonomic, so the workers doesn't have uh, feel the effort to do this all day, and also possible, so all the tooling we need, screw or other thing, has to fit in, and not to have clash in order to assemble the parts. All the planning in the world still requires putting it into practice. So all these activities done before, and let's say some months before the start of production. Pre-production starts by checking the quality of the parts arriving at the factory. We have to check together all the parts coming from these 200 and more suppliers all over the world in this phase. Those parts are sorted in various areas of the factory and then placed on carts that head directly to the line. We have 22 stations and we have to assemble 2,000 parts. You can imagine how many parts per station we should manage. And all the parts are coming with boxes. So every worker in each station has only the parts they need to assemble for one car. They don't have to choose, they don't have to find the right boxes. He receives some trolley like this, in a way, for example, this is a part, which is basically already with support old, with the pictures. Some of those parts arrive at the early stations on the line, where the Orokan's hybrid chassis starts to take shape. We are using not only aluminium, but also carbon fiber. And we are using carbon fiber where we need more strength. The carbon fiber has a unique combination between uh, light, weight, and strength. So we were using, in an intelligent way, the carbon fiber when we need more strength for the car. Carbon fiber really is Lamborghini's specialty. It's what they've really hung their hat on. It's a cutting-edge material for a very high-tech machine that needs to succeed for Lamborghini to stay alive. In Santaga da Bolognese, the pressure is mounting as Lamborghini attempts to replace their best-selling machine. The key to their success comes down to a very earthly material, carbon. A basic element finding new life inside of the state-of-the-art Lamborghini carbon fiber facility. A couple decades ago, Lamborghini decided to look into carbon fiber. A lot of car companies looked at it, decided it was too expensive, and moved on. We have an expertise of more than 30 years in the research and development of carbon fiber material. Lamborghini kept with it, they kept researching it, and today they're on the leading edge of carbon fiber technology. Like an Italian model, the brand is obsessed with weight and weight reduction. The cars are getting heavier and heavier over the decades. Due to different reasons, safety, active and passive safety, comfort, all these things. Weight is a supercar's enemy because it reduces speed. Weight to power ratio is a really key factor and success for the future. And weight reduction is more important of horsepower increase. If you reduce weight from the car, you will perceive in every single moment. When you accelerate the car, when you brake the car, when you go in a tight cornering, and you really perceive the vending behavioral of the car. The key word for us is mainly carbon fiber, which is a very light and stiff material. They're building most of the car out of it at this point, and they're exploring ways to use carbon to create structures that are light and stiff. <laughs> That exploration results in a brand new chassis that's 10% lighter than the Gallardo's, but 50% stiffer. In a company like Lamborghini, we can really also experiment a new material because we can offer something special. To give an example, a kind of composite material that we call forged composite, and this kind of fiber is exactly what is used also in the golf club of Callaway. A supercar sharing carbon technology from a golf club sounds surprising. It shouldn't be, thanks to a very unique agreement between three very diverse organizations. It's not unusual for car companies to look out to other industries to see where they can find new materials, new processes, but Lamborghini has been so focused on carbon fiber, they've really reached out to places you wouldn't expect, Boeing, the University of Washington, and, and Callaway Golf Clubs. The weight can affect everything. It affects your swing, it affects how fast your car can accelerate. The Lambo strategy for speed comes into focus on the new Orokan. The machine features a hybrid carbon fiber and aluminum chassis, with the front and rear sections made entirely from lightweight alloys, while the occupant safety cell is completely made from carbon fiber. The entire hybrid chassis weighs just 200 kilograms. 
The challenge is the joint between carbon fiber and aluminum, in which uh, it has to be designed to resist all the stress we have in the car during the use of the car. Unlike most car factories, at Lamborghini, they install the interior before the drivetrain. They install the carpet, the center console, and the dashboard. The gauges in front of you are not gauges, it's an LCD screen. <laughs> You have one big screen in front of you that does everything. You can configure it to have a big tachometer or a big speedometer. It's very driver focused. While mechanics continue to assemble the new Huracan, in another part of the factory, artisans handcraft Lamborghini interior pieces. Just 50 meters from the Huracan line, hides of leather are lined up. The hides arrive at the factory already treated and colored. The range of color options is only limited by imagination. Master leather workers inspect each hide for imperfections. A computer-controlled cutting machine optimizes the number of panels cut from the material before craftsmen mold and secure the leather to the trim panels. Then they stitch them together one by one. Choose the upgraded interior package, and each artisan will use 30 meters worth of thread. Finally, finished leather pieces head to the line. Station 11 is perhaps the most famous location in the factory, where the Lamborghini V10 is prepped for installation. Here we are in one of the most important stations of the line, in which we are assemble the engine, so 610 horsepower, with the gearbox. Lamborghini tradition is a naturally aspirated engine, which has an outstanding torque already at very low revs. The weight of that tradition rests on the shoulders of Stefan Mazzetti. Here in Lamborghini, we have the responsibilities of the powertrain, so it means mainly transmission and engines. Making it work together means creating a one-of-a-kind V10 engine called the LP610-4. The V10, it is really compact engine, but with a really very high displacement, 5.2 liters. It's a naturally aspirated, so very emotional engine. It is really a unique piece of engine art. Italian high-performance art that's sub-assembled on a jig next to the main line. Basically, we assemble the heart of the car inside the body. They install the engine to the LDF, or Lamborghini Doppia Frisione, seven-speed transmission. It's a, a super sport double clutch. The gearbox is a really compact because we wanted to make it really shorter. A double clutch transmission is essentially two traditional clutches in the same case. One stack contains first, third, fifth, and seventh gears. The other holds second, fourth, and sixth. When a driver accelerates in one gear, the other stack engages the next gear in preparation. Shifting gears takes just a few hundredths of a second. Installing the transmission to the engine takes only a few moments longer. This gearbox and engine then is going to the, uh, the car in the so-called marriage station. The marriage looks almost effortless but installation has to be highly accurate. And we have to be really precise because if you can see the car and the space between the, the chassis and the engine that is really narrow. We are talking about even less than millimeter. So our work has to be precise to avoid any collision. The tight margin for error is all due to the distinctive mid-engine design layout. This is a unique uh, challenge for Lamborghini to put the engine on the, on, the, on the back. They install the oil tank, the air box, and the drive shaft.
To move the machines around, Lamborghini employs a variety of carrier systems. When the car is just a body, we have uh, basically a carrier system which is come taking the car from the bottom. And then the worker, if needs to have uh, the car higher or, or lower, can adjust the position of the car. Then when the line is turning to the second part, we have uh, this kind of uh, carrier which is taking the car from a hook because we need also to work on the button of the car. The first stop after a new Huracan is picked up by the massive hook is station 12, where the carbon ceramic disc brakes are installed. Our car is so powerful and the speed is so high that we need something to break the car in a really short uh, distance. The pre-assembly area in which we are starting from the single components, with the help of this uh, automatic tool, we assemble all the parts to create this uh, uh, brake system. It takes 22 minutes to build each carbon ceramic brake subassembly. Collectively, they can bring the machine from 112 kilometers per hour to a dead stop in just 43.8 meters. That's two times the length of a cricket pitch. The factory is built on a lean manufacturing principle. What we are trying to do here when we were designing the line is to apply what we call the lean manufacturing principle. It sounds modern, but it's not. The idea owes its genesis to an automotive concept that's over 100 years old. We try to design a line really compact with all the pre-assembly area on the, line, on the side of the line in a really short distance. In 1913, Henry Ford radically changes the automotive world forever with the introduction of the moving mass assembly line. The system is a revelation, and it radically cuts down the time it takes to build a machine. But more importantly, it cuts down on wasted motion near the line. By the 1990s, the German auto industry, including Audi, Lamborghini's parent company, takes the process to the next level. They realize that it's not just about cutting down the time it takes to build a machine, but the number of parts at the factory. The less parts wait, the less inventory on hand, the fewer mistakes that can be made, the faster you can build a product. The result is lean manufacturing. The pre-assembly is here and the assembly point is there. For the engine is the same, for the dashboard is the same. This is something that we try to apply in all our uh, production. While the theory of lean manufacturing isn't new, Lamborghini's use of it is rather cutting edge. This philosophy is not new, but it's new in the way, the way in which we are applying, because we have only men. We have people which assemble the Lamborghini. So the challenge for us was to uh, convert this kind of principle born for a huge and big manufacturers to our craftsmanship activity. The lean manufacturing philosophy is an old idea, but it's managed by a modern technology. This is a touch screen. Every station is at least one, some station even two. The touch screens keep the factory constantly updated on the progress of each machine. If the worker needs to understand how to assemble something, he can go inside here, he's going a server, and he's written all the cycle plan on the car. After brake install, they connect the Huracan's power to the machine's four-wheel drive system. Four-wheel drive is now a Lamborghini hallmark. Once you get to this level of power, it just becomes easier to put it to all four wheels. Using a very special torque converter, the device controls how much of the engine's power is sent to the front wheels. The challenge uh, is uh, uh, to bring the right power in the front. We choose electronic controlled torque distributor because in this way we can choose in real time the exact amount of torque you want to have in the front and of course in the rear of the car. The electronic torque converter senses traction loss in mere milliseconds. There are a lot of ECUs, a lot of power calculation. 
and uh, these ECUs, these control units, are learning every time what happens for driver behavior, and they are checking also the ground situation, if there is a slippering, if there is ice, if there is rain, and so on. And so they are able to react in very few milliseconds. Under normal driving conditions, the system diverts 30% of the engine torque to the front wheels. However, if the machine loses traction at the back, 50% of the torque is immediately sent to the front. If for some reason one wheel or one axle is splitting, you can transfer immediately some torque in the other axle and to avoid maybe oversteering or an understeering. At high speed, the system alters once again, no longer sending power forward. Instead, the Orokan uses all 100% of the torque at the rear axle. The power calculation inside the car is uh, something that it is tremendous. The benefit is that you can have uh, a continuous changing in the torque applied to the ground. Finally, after almost two days of hand assembly, a new Lamborghini Huracan is ready for final inspection. Yeah, you see the, all the lines and all the edge. We have to respect it to have the maximum precision. We are talking about less than a millimeter in order to see that the line which is starting here is following there on the front hood without any disruption. This is our big challenge when you see all this edgy design, which is fantastic. It's taken 1,460 days to handcraft that dream. It's taken four long years of faith, a continued desire to pen radical shapes, creative engineering solutions, and the means to live outside of the conventional automotive landscape. Finally, Lamborghini's latest creation is ready to attack the track. The Lamborghini Huracan. The machine takes its name from a Spanish Conte de la Patia fighting bull, but it traces its lineage back to a single machine, the best-selling Italian supercar ever made, the Lamborghini Gallardo. During a 10-year production run, 14,022 Gallardos are sold. To equal the machine's success, the Huracan banks on its Italian heritage. I think the fact that the, the Huracan follows the Gallardo so closely in its styling tells us that it was just time for a replacement. It was clear to the company that this was a successful business model uh, and it was a successful product for the company as a whole. Today, the Huracan is a 610 horsepower V10 beast. It's all about the theater. You know, you, you flip up a little cover to hit a start button. And then the car starts and it's loud enough to wake your neighbors up a block and a half away. Every single piece of that car is hexagonal and it's just over the top. It's not often anymore that you get a V10 engine. They're pretty rare. So it's really special when you do find one. The 5.2 liter engine generates 412 foot-pounds of torque. They've updated it substantially from the Gallardo, it makes a ton of power. And one of the coolest things they've done is they've made it sound cool. That sound is a unique Italian tune. Part of the charm and part of the theater is the noise and the revs. V10 engines inherently just generally don't sound that great, but you know, the Italians couldn't put out a car that sounded bad, and they've really tuned this one to make it sound like a race car. The Huracan not only sounds like a race car, but it accelerates like one too. Going zero to 100 kilometers per hour in just 2.5 seconds. Just three times longer than an F-18 jet fighter to 100 kph. Launch control is pretty brutal on this car. It actually physically hurts. It feels like you got kicked in the chest by a mule. It will, you know, smack you in the back of the head and launch you down the street before you even knew what happened. Continue to keep the throttle wide open and the machine will rocket from zero to 200 kilometers per hour in just 9.9 .9 seconds. An eighth the speed of a bullet fired from a gun. And the Oricon really carries on that lineage of making a sports car. 
This time they really got serious about track performance, about making this car go around a turn faster, and they've added all this technology to it. That technology helps the machine hit a top speed of 325 kilometers per hour. It's a car that they've designed to be more of a sports car and go out and actually go around corners quickly and you know really be fun to drive. The machine's ultra-low power-to-weight ratio of 2.3 kilograms per horsepower helps it slice and dice in the twisties. The Huracan is so easy to drive that any novice could go in and get on a racetrack and not have any problem. We want to have the driver in charge and not the car. What we want is that you are feeling at home immediately, that it fits like a glove, that it's not the car dominating you. That home features state-of-the-art shock absorbers that adjust the suspension in fractions of a second to give the best traction possible. These special shock absorbers and these gyroscopes and all these computer programs with the goal of making this car faster around a racetrack and around a winding road. The Orokan features magnetorheological dampers. Cutting-edge shock absorbers contain tiny metal particles in the synthetic oil. When voltage is applied, the particles generate a magnetic field, which adaptively changes the amount of rebound the shock experiences. The end result is an infinitely adjustable suspension system. They really want this to be a well-rounded supercar that you really can go out and drive anywhere and be just as much fun to drive as any of the competition. That competition isn't for everyone. With a base price of 189,000 euros, the Urakan lives in the realm of the ultra exotic. Yeah, you're a connoisseur, at least, or you're definitely you're not following the beaten path there. You're doing something different. It started with an argument and a passion for greatness. A little over 50 years later, Lamborghini is still chasing the same dream to build exotic, exclusive, high performance machines for the ultra wealthy. Whether they continue to succeed comes down to a single word, a Rakan. Lamborghini got their recipe right with the Gallardo. It's relatively comfortable, doesn't really beat you up, but still gives you enough sound and bouncing around enough to know that you're doing something bad. It hits the right notes. It's the newest machine from the house of the Raging Bull, and now it faces the ultimate pressure, replacing the best-selling Italian supercar Ever built. We have half a century in, uh, in our back, and uh, for us, the motto last year was 100 years of innovation in half the time. And I think this is exactly what we have to look forward uh, uh, for the next decades to come.